Good evening to one and all. Good evening, uh, various, uh, various faculty from different medical colleges, respected Dr. Rudesh, uh, the HOD of uh, Department of General Surgery from Ramaya, and, uh, and various faculty from MS Ramaya Medical College. Uh, today, I'll be talking about atraumatic splenic rupture in a case of chronic calcific pancreatitis. Splenic rupture as a, is a very rare complication of chronic pancreatitis with approximately only 65 reported cases in literature. Here, we cite the case of a young male who was recently diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis who had an incidentally detected atraumatic rupture of a spleen. And splenectomy was reserved and a conservative spleen preserving approach was adopted. A 19-year-old male, a known case of chronic calcific pancreatitis, presented to our OPD with pain in the epigastric and left hypochondriac region, the radiation of pain to the back, there was significant weight loss, early satiety, no history of trauma or history of fever, and on the region, extending into the lumbar region. The patient underwent a CCT of the abdomen and pelvis, and issued chronic calcific pancreatitis with a pseudocyst, as you can see, a pseudocyst, also, incidentally detected, there was an ill-defined, non-enhancing, hyperattenuating area in the superior pole of the spleen, which was likely uh, called as a splenic rupture with a large subcapsular perisplenic acute hematoma with an approximate volume of 1,000 cc. The patient underwent an exploratory laparotomy and proceed. Intraoperatively, here we can see the pseudocyst of the pancreas impinging on the posterior wall of the stomach and open cystogastrostomy was performed with anastomosis. Also, incidentally, as we can see here, there was a splenic hematoma which was evacuated in the perisplenic region <coughs> and a drain was placed. Here we did not do a splenectomy as there was no active bleeding after the hematoma was evacuated and hence a conservative approach was adopted. Conclusion, there are no specific guidelines in the management of this rare entity and in the literature operative surgical management involved a splenectomy with or without a distal pancreatic. Here we attempted at a conservative management of the spleen with no post-operative complications. The hemodynamic status of the patient with absence of active bleeding interoperated from the spleen forms the basis of this approach. The term spontaneous rupture is often used in reference to splenic rupture in case of chronic pancreatitis. This term is reserved for a healthy spleen which has ruptured without over trauma. The most common cause of pathological rupture of spleen is neoplastic, followed by infectious causes, among which the most commonest is infectious mononucleosis and in the tropics, malaria. Chronic pancreatitis as a, as a cause of atraumatic rupture of spleen is rare. Proposed mechanism of splenic injury intro, it, the, form, the basis of this forms is because of the anatomic proximity of the tail of the pancreas with the splenic hilum. And splenic vein thrombosis, dissection of the pancreatic sources into the splenic hilum, acute pancreatitis, mostly involving the region of the tail, leading to triptic erosion at the splenic hilum, is one of the proposed mechanisms. The treatment depends on the hemodynamic status of the patient and a splenectomy with or without distal pancreatectomy is a management modality in patients who are hemodynamically unstable and all the patients have undergone a splenectomy in the 65 cases reported in literature. Okay. Open for discussion. Thank you, Dr. Nihal. Dr. Nagoshan? Um, yeah, hi. Um, uh, I was just wondering, you know, uh, uh, what was your uh, preoperative diagnosis? So, acute pancreatitis with a pseudocyst of the pancreas. Sir. Pseudocyst of the pancreas. So, while yes. actually draining the pseudocyst, you found the incidental hematoma. Am I correct? Uh, no, sir. A contrast enhanced uh, CT of the abdomen and pelvis was performed, which had detected a, a splenic rupture in the superior pole of the spleen. Hmm. Okay. Now, the CT was a contrast-enhanced CT, no? Yes, sir. And there wasn't any active bleeding uh, into the cyst, into your pseudocyst? No, sir. There was no active bleeding. Just only a perisplenic hematoma with around 1,000 cc of the collection was uh, detected, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, sir? Any other questions from the audience? Okay, shall we move to the next one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. Okay. So left thigh swelling by Dr. Pooja. 
Good evening, uh, respected uh, faculty and dear friends. Uh, we're going to be presenting. Uh, we're going to be presenting a case report on Morel Lavalley lesion. Uh, Morel Lavalley lesion is a uh, condition wherein there is abrupt uh, 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 detachment of the skin and the subcutaneous tissue from the underlying fascia. This usually occurs during uh, high velocity traumas as in uh, road traffic accidents. Here, because of the shearing forces, the, the uh, two layers get separated, which causes internal degloving, and a new plane is created, and the disrupted blood vessels and the lymphatics will pour into this new cavity, giving rise to a hemolymphatic collection. And they're often associated with fractures of acetabulum and pelvis. In our case, we had a 27 year old female patient who came to us with a, a history of swelling in the left thigh since five days. And she also gave history of trauma to the same region six months back. On examination, there was a large ill-defined soft fluctuant swelling in the left thigh, and there was no local rise of temperature, but tenderness and induration was present. Initially, we thought of uh, differential diagnosis like hematoma, seroma, and an abscess. Uh, CCT thigh was done, which showed a well-defined encapsulated uh, uh, 1000 ml collection in the deep subcutaneous plane which was in favor of Murray Lavalley lesion, hence we made a diagnosis. Patient underwent incision and drainage, and 1,000 ml of serous non-foul smelling fluid was drained, and the wound was left open for secondary healing. The fluid yielded no growth, and the histopathology showed features suggestive of chronic inflammation. The patient underwent regular dressings, and the wound healed. Uh, this condition is not very rare. However, it is underreported because of misdiagnosis and delay in diagnosis. There is not enough data uh, regarding this lesion in literature, and there is no standard guideline for its treatment. Uh, despite this, it is still important for a clinician to know the, uh, be aware of this condition because of the potential complications that it can cause. That is, an uh, overlying skin can, uh, can uh, have sensory loss or can undergo ischemic necrosis, or if fracture fixation is attempted, it can cause implant infection. Uh, the, I would like to conclude uh, saying that in all cases of trauma, it is important to at least consider this condition so that uh, uh, potential complications like this can be avoided and uh, we can have a bet better patient outcome. There are many uh, case reports on this condition uh, and one among them uh, which is very significant is the first one uh, which happened in the University of uh, St. Paul uh, in Brazil wherein uh, a patient was misdiagnosed uh, uh, with uh, necrotizing fasciitis instead of moral lavalley and had to undergo a series of debridements which resulted in a very large wound which was later difficult to close. Uh, retrospectively, when they saw, they diagnosed him with moral lavalley and then uh, so this shows that uh, early detection could have uh, brought about a better outcome in this patient. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if I may ask, you know, was an ultrasound done in the first instance, ma, or you went straight ahead for a CT? Uh, yes, sir. We did an ultrasound which only showed that there was a collection. Uh, but uh, we went ahead with CT because we wanted to rule out uh, uh, like uh, psoas abscess and all those things. So that is why we went ahead with CT. That is when we incidentally diagnosed with this condition. Okay. Now, in the CT, I think you know it looks like a well-encapsulated lesion. Am I correct? Yes, sir. It is. Um, was there a role to put in a needle and aspirate? Uh, no, sir. We did not do that. We uh, directly went ahead with the incision and drainage, sir. Because it was a very large collection, and uh, that is why we went ahead with the uh, IND directly. Looks like a big incision, you know. I was trying to see, you know, because uh, the fluid looks like a seroma, no? Uh, yes. Uh, so I was just thinking, you know, whether you could yeah, have put in a needle or put in a percutaneous drain and got away with it. But anyway, no, that's yes. good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Puja. Any other questions? Uh, compared to hematoma. When, when do you appreciate these lesions? What is the duration? So the, uh, when it comes to the content of this lesion, it's pretty much same as the seroma. And there's no studies which have shown that there is a difference between, uh, they've not studied about the content of the, uh, uh, the fluid as such. 
So for all practical purposes, right now it's, it is considered and treated like a serum only. The only difference is that uh, the complications which can occur because of the facial uh, separation, uh, the complications which occur, the like ischemic necrosis and all that, that is what uh, uh, makes us, uh, and that is why we should be aware of this condition, sir. If it were a regular seroma, it won't cause such complications. It can be treated slowly. But in this case, treatment should be very early before the uh, necrosis sets in. So that mechanism is uh, what is uh, important here. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. We'll move on to the next paper. This time is up for the discussion Thank also. You. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. Uh, the next presentation is a Kalsi Forum Lexis. This Saran Keshav is not well. He will be presenting instead of me. Yes, Dr. Sachin. Good evening, respected faculty and my dear friends. Presenting you a case of uh, calciform ligament cyst. Uh, introduction. Calciform ligament cysts are a very uh, rare entity. Only so far, only transcopically treated calciform ligament cyst excision. Uh, history uh, coming to a six, uh, uh, history coming to a 69 year old patient who presented with mass in the epigastric region since one month and history of pain abdomen, which is localized to epigastric and right hypochondria since 10 days. Uh, on examination, uh, the, uh, fullness was noted in the epigastric region, as you can see from the uh, picture. Um, and on palpation, a soft, non-tender mass was felt. Uh, the size of the mass was 5 into 6 centimeter, which was mobile in the horizontal plane. And the plane of the swelling was intra-abdominal. On percussion, a dull note was heard. Uh, or the uh, swelling is not continuous with the liver dullness. Uh, contrast and CT scan was done, which revealed an epigastric cyst measuring 62 into 77 into 99 millimeters with uh, two small calcific foci, as you can see. Uh, coming to the procedure, uh, a diagnostic laparoscopy and laparoscopy excision was done under general anesthesia. As you can see in the video, this is the uh, image of the uh, picture of the cyst which was dissected and then fluid was aspirated intraoperatively. And intra, uh, intraoperative finding, as you can see, uh, 10 into 7 into 6 centimeter cyst, uh, wherein the fluid, aspirated fluid was sent for uh, cytology and the cyst wall for histopathology. Uh, the cyst fluid was negative for malignant cells and Revealed, uh, it revealed that it was just a simple cyst. Coming to a review of literature, the first case was reported in in the in USA, Rochester, Minnesota, wherein the patient presented uh, with mass per abdomen and uh, pain abdomen, and a uh, patient underwent a laparotomy for the same. Discussion: uh, Primary cysts of the ligament of uh, liver are developed due to congenital mesenteric. Uh, Effect they present with varied symptoms and uh, uh, laparoscopy can be considered diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much. Um, was there any history of trauma or any surgical intervention? No, in sir, the past? no history of trauma or surgical intervention. What could be the cause of cyst in this case? What could be the cause? Sir, it's a, a primary cyst, sir. Uh, the develop, like congenital anomaly. Congenital. Yes, sir. Patient age is 69. Till 69 years, he never had any issues. Just one month, he has presented with uh, master abdomen and pain. Okay. What a differential diagnosis? Uh, so differential uh, that then, we can consider in this age group is one could be uh, hydratated disease of the liver, uh, pseudocyst of pancreas, and uh, it's in the ligament. Yes, no? sir. Uh, lipoma, lipoma of the hmm. falciform ligament, uh, leomyoma of the falciform ligament, 
lymphangioma of the uh, ligament, alciform ligament. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter. Importance of clinical examination in modern world of investigation-based medicine. Dr. Vignesham. Good evening, uh, respected uh, faculty and uh, my colleagues. So today I'm going to talk about a poster uh, that highlights the importance of clinical examination in today's era of investigation-based medicine. So coming to the case presentation, a 55-year-old male presented to our OPD with complaints of pain abdomen since the past 15 days. On examination, the solitary swelling of 16 to 11 centimeters, as shown in the figure, uh, was noted. It was smooth in surface with rounded borders and firm in consistency. It was mobile in the direction of perpendicular, uh, sorry, mobile in the direction perpendicular to the line of misentry. CCT was done, which showed a circumferential asymmetric lesion of 9 to 18 to 6 centimeters, as shown in the image, uh, with few uh, tiny lymph nodes, surrounded by few tiny lymph nodes. This was inconclusive, and the impression given by the radiologist showed an either a neoplastic or inflammatory lesion, which could be either gist or cox. Since this was inconclusive, an MRI abdomen was done, which revealed uh, a well-defined lobulated lesion of 85 into 108 millimeters, which is hyper intense on T2. And this was also suggestive of a neoplastic lesion. The first diagnosis being carcinoid, the second gist, and lymphoma. So as we can see here, even post two uh, high-end radiological investigations, we were unclear about the diagnosis of this patient. Uh, fortunately, uh, when this case was presented in our class by all of us postgraduates, an, a neck node, as shown in this image, was noted by our faculty. And this finding, which was missed in all the earlier examinations, helped narrow down the diagnosis to lymphoma. So something which was even missed post two extensive radiological investigations was identified and uh, we could narrow down on a differential only due to this solitary cervical node, which was seen. So uh, the provisional diagnosis of lymphoma was made and the patient underwent a diagnostic laparoscopy to, and the biopsy was taken from this lobulated abdominal mass and uh, a biopsy was also taken from the left submembrane lymph node. Both the biopsies uh, revealed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this incidence shows us the importance of a complete clinical, uh, to be particular, a complete head-to-toe examination and how critical and vital it is and how many a times, even when investigations cannot uh, help us narrow down an investigation, a simple head-to-toe examination can make a big difference. A recent study done in 2017, published in uh, uh, the Clinical uh, Journal of Medicine, showed that 66% of trainees were inadequate in their physical examination and 31% of medical trainees even claim that they've never seen their superiors <coughs> perform a clinical examination in their daily practice. Another study, which was done in 2007, revealed that uh, there was a declining, uh, dec declining interest in clinical examination, primarily due to the uh, rise and ease of availability of uh, high-end investigations. So to conclude, uh, it's important that we as young doctors always remember that investigations are only an adjunct to diagnosis and can never be solely relied upon and many a times, as we saw in this case, can mislead the clinician. So to conclude, a thorough clinical examination will always remain relevant and is mandatory despite the continuing advancement in various investigatory modalities. These are the references. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, if I may ask, uh, it's an interesting case. You know, what was the CT reported as? Sir, uh, the CT, uh, uh, the, it was done outside, so it was not done in our institute, and they gave a report of either inflammatory or neoplastic pathology, which could probably be GIST or uh, uh, TB, sir. So they, they were, it was inconclusive, so an MRI was also done outside. The patient was completely worked up outside, sir, and the MRI uh, was more suggestive of a neoplastic issue. This was the CD. So it, it, since it was unsure, they went ahead with an MRI, which was again more, it leaned more towards carcinoid or gist than lymphoma.
sir uh, clinically uh, it presented similar to mesenteric cyst sir and it was also uh, mobile in the line perpendicular to the attachment mesenteric attachment any other questions please it's a wonderful observation because uh, nowadays more we are depending on uh, other uh, modern modalities of investigation. So, it is a mandatory to examine from head to toe. Uh, you should strip the patient, examine each and everything, so you won't miss the diagnosis. It's a wonderful case, good observation. Yes, so, uh, may, may I come in, sir, Dr. Lakshman? Yes, sir. I had put something in the chat box. Uh, so, if the, my question is, is just a biopsy of the abdominal lesion enough? If that were so, the neck node biopsy itself would have been enough to clinch the diagnosis and give the patient whatever chemotherapy that was required. Yes, sir. That could have been done, sir. But since the, it was a large mass and we were still unsure, sir, we, we okay. went ahead with the diagram. And there was just one uh, isolated cervical node, sir. Yeah, but also it is well known that if you have resection of an abdominal lymphomatous mass, their response to chemo is much better than if you leave residual disease. So, while it is a very good, uh, you know, you brought attention to uh, the importance of clinical examination, I do believe that the postgraduates must know that when you have a lymphomatous mass which is resectable, it is correct to resect it, so that the overall response to chemotherapy is better. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vignesh, for a very good uh, poster. Thank you, sir. Next, uh, a rare case of follicular neoplasia of liver. Yes. Okay, sorry. This is Rosai Dothman disease by Dr. Adnan. <coughs> Good evening, faculty members and my dear friends. Today, I'm going to present a case report of Rosai Doffman disease. Rosai Doffman is a rare disorder. It is characterized by proliferation and accumulation of non lanthanide cell histocytes, commonly seen in uh, accumulated in uh, cervical lymph nodes, leading to cervical lymphadenopathy. Common extranodal sites where Histocytes get accumulated are skin, CNS, kidney, and GIT. Other, uh, it is predominantly seen in children and adolescents. Here is a case of 18-year-old female patient hailing from Bangalore, came with complaints of swelling in the right middle aspect of uh, thigh, which was insidious in onset, uh, started in childhood, gradually progressed three times its original size over two years, Associated with brownish discoloration of overlying skin. No other symptoms were noted. On examination, inspection, uh, solitary swelling noted in the right medial aspect of thigh with ill-defined borders of size 10 into 5 centimeters. Uh, uh, um, skin over the swelling had brownish discoloration. On palpation, there was local rise of temperature. There was no tenderness seen. And the uh, surface of the swelling was smooth with ill-defined borders of size 11 into 7 centimeters in vertical and horizontal dimension. Skin over the swelling was non-pinchable. Uh, 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 it was blanching on uh, applying pressure and it was uh, non-compressible. A provisional diagnosis was nevolipoma and hematoma. USG soft tissue was done outside, which showed high flow AV mal malformation. Uh, CT angio did not show any AV malformations, hence MRI was done for. When we did MRI, uh, we found out a soft tissue lesion in the subcutaneous plane extending into the intramuscular uh, region. Here you can see the lesion. Here are a few pictures of MRI. A patient underwent wide excision of the swelling and the mass was sent for histopathology which showed, uh, uh, which was highly suggestive of Rosai-Doffman disease. Here you can see 
uh, histocytes ingesting uh, neutrophils uh, and plasma cells, which is a characteristic feature of Rohe Doffman disease. Uh, as I told, Rosai Doffman disease is a very rare disease and its prevalence is 1 in 2 lakh. 43% uh, of cases are uh, present as extranodal. Skin and paranasal sinuses are the most common uh, extranodal site. 3% of all the cases, uh, there is no uh, lymphadeno uh, lymphadenopathy detected, whereas it is more dominant in male than in females. Cutaneous Rosai Doffman disease occurs more often in females in their 20s or 30s. Here are my references. Thank you. Any questions, sir? Any questions? Any questions, please? Yeah. Can I come in? Yeah. Um, why did you do such a wide ex extensive you know, dissection? You removed a lot of muscle as well. Uh, sir, uh, the, the, sir uh, the muscle was not removed, sir. Basically, just the, just the deep fascia and the subcutaneous uh, tissue was excised, sir. Okay, so this, this picture is just uh, after you removed the thing, the what yes. picture you have shown? Sir, yes, sir. This is, yeah, just the subcutaneous tissue and the fascia, sir, along okay. with the skin. Okay. Uh, the muscle was not removed, sir. Okay, right. Uh, if I may ask, you know, is there a risk of uh, malignant transformation for this no, lesion, you know, uh, required to be excised in the first instance? Sir, uh, if left uh, for prolonged time, there is a chance of malignancy, sir, but generally they present as a benign tumor, sir. Uh, can I interrupt here? It, it, it behaves in a malignant fashion. So the treatment is basically wide excision, and there are chances of recurrence, particularly in the external type of disease. Any role of chemotherapy, anything else, sir? Any chemotherapy, any adjuvant no other than excision? Any or post excision would sir, you do anything? It was, else? Uh, it, was, it was marginal excision, sir. There is no role of chemotherapy, sir. Chemotherapy is marginal. If it recurs again, marginal, sir. Chemotherapy. Okay. See, do you think then you should consider this as a differential diagnosis for cervical lymphadenopathy if it happens in cervical nodes? Uh, no, sir. As I told you, this is a very rare dis disorder, sir. A very sir. rare disease. Uh, it is highly unlikely, sir. We should consider this as a differential diagnosis. Can I finish it through with me? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Dr. Adnan. Let's go to the next poster. A rare case of follicular nodular hyperplasia, liver. Dr. Chetan. Good evening, dear teachers and uh, my dear friends. Today, I am presenting a case of focal nodular hyperplasia of liver. So, coming to introduction, focal nodular hyperplasia is a very unusual benign condition with uh, unknown etiology, where there is a focal overgrowth of functioning liver tissue by supporting uh, trauma, stroma. Uh, patients are usually middle-aged females, reproductive age group, with, there is no association of underlying liver disease. Uh, this case history is, uh, she was a 33-year-old female, presented with complaints of mass in the right upper abdomen since one year, associated with pain, which was uh, on and off in nature, and there was no history of use of oral contraceptives, and she was a known case of autoimmune thyroiditis during uh, pregnancy. So, patient underwent uh, an annual health checkup in which ultrasound uh, showed a well defined oval isoic solid lesion uh, with uh, no calcification or cavitations. 
So general physical examination and uh, vitals were all uh, within normal limits. Uh, systemic examination, uh, the, there was a mass palpable in the right hypochondrium, uh, uh, mid-clavicular line, three centimeter below the coastal margin. Uh, the smooth surface and uh, moves well with respiration. So there we uh, took on investigation to rule out all the malignant causes. Alpha fetoprotein and HVSAG and HCV, CEA, which uh, came out negative. So we did a CT which showed a mass arising from the right right lobe of the liver, the inferior right lobe, which are with prominent arterial retreatment. So intraoperatively, there was a 10 into 8 centimeter uh, vascular exophytic growth arising from segment 5 and 6 and uh, dilated lymphatics noted around the gallbladder. So we went on the laparotomy with polycystectomy and uh, wide resection of segment 5 and 6 of liver. So HP report, which was suggestive of focal nodular hyperplasia of liver. Coming to discussion. Preoperatively, it's very difficult to diagnose focal nodular hyperplasia and uh, surgical resection of liver with adequate margin is a treatment of choice and uh, focal nodular hyperplasia do not have any malignant potential. So these are the references. And thank you. Any questions, please? Uh, what is rare and unusual about this case? So, uh, this case usually the seen in middle-aged women. It's an exophytic mass, sir. Usually there will be small lesions uh, which uh, do not require any treatment. If the lesion is very big and it's causing uh, pain, so I found this on the web. then only we'll go ahead and uh, do a wide resection, sir. As in this uh, case, the, there's a huge mass with highly vascular and uh, she had a complaint of pain, sir. It's a very rare finding, sir. Um, if I may ask, you know, can you go back on your slides, please, a little bit? I was, uh, you know, just a little, you know, was not... Uh, no, okay. No. Yes. The CT, please. CT image. CT, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, did you also do an MRI? No, no sir. We didn't do an MRI. Uh, only with the CT, we saw a mass arising from the right lobe of liver with uh, dental scarring, sir, and high vascular lesion, suspected of uh, focal nodular head. Okay. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Patient with diagnostic dilemma. Dr. Monica. Good evening, respected faculty and my dear friends. Uh, today, I will be presenting a red case report of delayed presentation of chronic operation in a patient with chronic pancreatitis, a diagnostic dilemma. Coming to the introduction, early mortality in acute pancreatitis is related to an overwhelming acute inflammatory response. But the late mortality is because of peripancreatic sepsis, vascular complications, and GI complications. So in our, in our patient, it's a 55-year-old uh, male patient who came with complaints of bleeding per rectum since 10 days, loose tools for 4 days, and abdominal pain, which was mainly in the right upper quadrant for the 4 days. He was a known smoker and chronic alcoholic for 15 years. And he was already treated for acute par pancreatitis uh, multiple times prior to the admission. On examination, it was found that patient had uh, tachycardia with the normal uh, blood pressure mild failure, and per abdomen examination showed the distension was present, diffuse tenderness in the abdomen, mostly on the right upper quadrant, with no guarding and uh, bowels also present. Per rectal examination was normal. On evaluation, it was found that patient had anemia and total counts were 
X ray showed only distended bubble loops. So, in view of this, patient was for lower GI bleed by blood transfusions. Uh, multiple uh, pneumoperitoneum which was seen with left uh, hypochondrium collection. So the patient uh, um, was uh, um, hemodynamically stable and was tolerating orally. Hence, the patient was not taken up for surgery and was managed conservatively. But on day 7 of admission, patient developed bilious vomiting, unable to pass platus and stool, tachycardia and tachypnea. So, was a, again, emergency surgical consent was taken and was uh, shifted to ICU and patient underwent emergency exploration. And it was found that patient had a splenic infarct, fecal peritonitis and perforation at the splenic flexure. And this patient underwent laparotomy, splenectomy with perforation repair and ileostomy. But this is the splenic infarct which is seen here. And this is the perforation which is at the splenic flexure. So, post operatively, patient was uh, still on inotropic support and went into refractory metabolic acidosis and complete renal shutdown, for which patient required dialysis. Despite all the measures, patient didn't make it, and uh, the cause of death was septic shock with multi organ dysfunction syndrome. Coming to the discussion, because the colon is in close approximately to the pancreas, the colonic complications occur. It can be from pseudo obstruction, necrosis to ischemic colitis. The incidence of colonic complication after acute pancreatitis is about 3.3%, but the same uh, will be 15% after an acute severe pancreatitis. So the incidence of colonic perforation after pancreatitis is not known and is still at the case report level. So, the colonic necrosis it takes about 25 days or more to present and the colonic strictures can take more than 50 days to present to us. And the degree of colonic involvement in case of pancreatitis can be from localized gas gaseous distension of transverse colon to the colonic fistula formation. So, why this colonic involvement will be there in the pancreatitis is because there may be extravasation of pancreatic enzymes which can uh, lead to the involvement or there can be pressure necrosis from pseudocysts or vascular occlusion or vascular damage by the pancreatic enzymes and there can be digestion of the gut wall by the bacteria or activated pancreatic enzymes. So, we will have to keep all these uh, in mind before um, diagnosing it. So, I would like to conclude by saying high index of suspicion is required to diagnose colonic perforation in patients who are known case of acute or chronic pancreatitis, as the mortality can be reduced by early surgical management. Thank you. Any questions, please? Should he have not operated the first time when it was diagnosed instead of waiting? Exactly. Uh, and why? And colonic perforations, which are not, you know, due to uh, interventions like polypectomy or things like that, where bowel is prepared, yes, you know, sir. just repairing colonic perforation won't work. So I think, you know, there are two, I feel, blaring mistakes. One is to just repair the colon and second is to not intervene when it was first diagnosed. At that time, patient was hemodynamically stable and had... Precisely. No, when you, you want to operate on a patient when he is well, not when he is unwell. Yes, sir. Uh, if I may, you know, add on uh, for what Dr. Ravi Shankar said, I entirely agree. You know, I wasn't sure, you know, what was the, you know, the initial problem. I thought we might have actually missed a trick there, you know, when we should have probably gone and done something uh, on the first day itself. Uh, but uh, anyway, you know, I'm not sure, you know, that the colonic perforation was actually because of chronic pancreatitis. You know, I tend to be a little bit more convinced on that. Um, but I think maybe something could have done. But I guess, you know, in the end, you know, whether it would have altered anything, I'm not sure. But certainly, I agree with Dr. Ravi Shankar on this one. Dr. Shikantaya, Vijay Kumar, kindly put us, uh, some light on this.
Is not okay. Thank you, Dr. Monica. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Last. So next paper is uh, a case report of Stekal Leo Mayama, Dr. Mohammed Soib. Good evening, Honorable President, Secretary, Respected Hajodisa, and Surgical Staff. Today I am presenting a rare case of Leo Mayama of CECOM, a case report. Leomyomas are a rare benign tumors which arises from the smooth muscle of choleric muscularis mucosa and sometimes muscularis propria. Usually their occurrence are more commonly seen in esophagus and stomach followed by small intestine which accounts for 23% and rarely seen in large bowel that accounts usually less than 1-3% to and presentation in cecum are less than 1%. Till now, in literature, only about 40 cases of cecal lioma have been updated. So, we are pre uh, presenting a case who was a 24-year-old uh, young male who came to our hospital with complaint of mass in the right lower abdomen and it was asymptomatic. So, on examination, we found a solitary mass in the right iliac fossa which was measuring around 19 to 6 cm with well-defined borders and with smooth surface and which was moving uh, horizontally. And rest of the abdominal examination was normal. So we got a CECT abdomen which showed a circumscribed lesion in the right inferior mesopholic space which was measuring around 5 to 6 into 7 centimeters with heterogeneous enhancement and which was compressing and displacing the terminal ileum, IC junction and cecum anterior laterally and colonoscopy was unremarkable. So uh, patient underwent right hemicolectomy with side to side ileal transverse anastomosis and interoperatively, there was around 6 into 8 into 8 centimeter was mass in the cecum near IC junction with adhesion to the lateral abdominal wall. And histopathologically, diagnosis was given as spindle cell tumor, uh, uh, query uh, gist or leomyoma or neurofibroma. However, on immunohistochemistry, it was uh, confirmed as leomyoma as it was staining positive for despin and smooth muscle acting. So, final diagnosis of leomyoma of cecum was done. Uh, so, coming to discussion, leomyoma uh, usually occurs uh, in males with the predominantly in a fifth to sixth period of time, and mostly they are asymptomatic if they present in present with up, up, abdominal obstruction or bleeding. And coronoscopy and intramural knowledge uh, can help uh, to show areas of classification areas of helpful to differentiate it from differential diagnosis of mastitis or ileocecal tuberculosis should be kept in mind. So, conclusion will be cecal leomyomas are very rare tumors which accounts less than 1% of GIST, JAT tumors. And colonoscopy and CCT abdomen will help uh, in arriving a definite diagnosis with immunohistochemistry with final diagnostic mortality. And surgical resection with white margins is the mainstay of treatment. Poster open for discussion. Uh, yeah, Ravishan sir. I thought this uh, Leo, term leomyoma has been given up. It all comes under the broad uh, spectrum of gist tumors. So I, I don't know whether it is, is it still being used? I think uh -huh. they are all classified under the broad term of gastrointestinal stromal tumors. There is nothing called leomyoma anymore as far as I know. Is he a pathologist reported it as leomyoma? Uh, sir, uh, histopathologically, they told it's a spindle cell tumor can be gist or leomyoma. So, uh, to reconfirm the accurate diagnosis, we got immunohistomic chemistry, sir, which uh, showed negative staining for CK, that is CD uh, 117, yeah, yeah. but positive staining for SMA and uh, Despin. See, if you, do, if you do dog 1 and dog 2, uh, it will it probably be positive because there is only 2 or 3 percent of uh, gist tumors which are CD117 and uh, dog one, dog two negative. So I think uh, it will still be classified as a gist tumor because I don't think leomyomas are accepted internationally anymore. 
Ravi uh, Shankar, I think Leomayama is still there, but incidence is less compared to Jez. I think he is talking about environment in positivity, Desmond and environment in positivity, which is not, not seen in Jez. Leomayama are the second largest or commonest retroperitoneal tumors also. So, Leomayama does exist. Leomayama will be there. Recently, we had a diagnosis of esophageal Leomayama. They do IHC. IHC is not confirming just and it is benign tumor with no mitosis. It is still a Leomayama. It can happen. If I may... Uh, thank you. you know, thank you for the clarification. Uh, Dr. Venkat and Dr. Srivatsa. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I ask, uh, you know, whether you have the images of the colonoscopy? You know, I would have thought, you know, you have done a colonoscopy. It would have been interesting to show us, you know, how the cecum area looked like. Uh, sir, in colonoscopy, actually, it was normal, sir. Uh, there was no any sub uh, intramural polyp or any sub uh, mucosal any growth could be seen, sir. So it was normal, sir. So Important, they reported, sir. you know, um, I just wanted to know whether it was actually distending properly, you know, because it looked like there might have been, you know, some luminal, uh, you know, intramural uh, compression just out of interest, you know, because uh, on CT, you know, the, the images are spectacular. So I was just wondering, you know, how the colonoscopy, you know, inside looked up, you know, looked at, that, that's all. But very interesting, very nice case. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed.